The purpose of this series of encounters that we are organizing is really to attract attention on the theme of Italian food discussed in a serious, deep, in-depth manner. And uh, um, as you know, you, you can talk about food in many different ways. We have here two wonderful colleagues from the Department of Food Studies here at New York University that is one of the best in the countries. They know how to talk about food in an interesting, engaging, and scientific way. And I am delighted and very appreciative for their presence and for the support that your department has given already to this series. Um, the panel tonight, you will see it's already uh, packed with experts in different fields that will talk about the specificities of Italian food, of the challenges for the future uh, when it comes to new agricultural techniques, uh, preservation of traditions, uh, and many other issues. I don't want to take more time because I have no expertise in the field, aside from the fact that I eat Italian food even too much. Um, and this panel is really impressive. Um, so uh, the uh, first speaker that I have the great pleasure to announce is the Consul General of Italy in New York, Minister Gianfranco uh, Genuardi. Grazie, direttore. Buonasera a tutti. Good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure and honor also for me to be here for the beginning of this new important New York chapter on uh, Italian table talks. I really thank uh, Gianfranco Sorrentino, the president of Gruppo Italiano, for this new initiative, and uh, Vincenzo Pascale and all the authoritative members of this group uh, because I think it's very timely, it's very important. It takes place here at uh, the NYU Casa Italiana in downtown in New York in the maybe, uh, not maybe, surely the culinary capital of the planet. Uh, as you know, for Italy it's very important and we are very proud in New York to have so many Italian flags everywhere of uh, Italian restaurants, Italian bars, Italian cafes. Uh, of course, food in a broad sense is part of the Italian soft power. We are very convinced about that. It's about Italian culture, about Italian history, about Italian identity. It's also about uh, technology. I'm happy that you mentioned here all the innovation process because we really also from the consular want to push forward this narrative, uh, which is a narrative of substance, that Italy is also about uh, innovation and food is, uh, is an area where we can talk uh, very easily about the, the Italian excellences in innovation. But also let me say that Italian food is also means uh, healthy food. And I'm very pleased to, to say here, to repeat what also Prime Minister Gentiloni said here in this very uh, same place about the fact that Italy was ranked first in the Bloomberg Health Index uh, last year. That was uh, an impressive uh, achievement, uh, sometimes uh, forgotten by even by us Italians. And I think we have to, uh, to be very aware of this and we are very proud of that. And be sure that the Italian institutions here in New York are uh, very supportive of that. And um, about healthy and health, uh, just know that uh, for the Festa della Repubblica for June the 2nd this year, we are going to focus a lot on sport, as uh, many of you already know. Uh, we, are, we are going to do for the first time in many, many years an Italy run, an Italian run in Central Park on Sunday, the, uh, June the 3rd. Um, this is, I think, the first announcement we are, uh, public announcement, and uh, also a, an Italian sailing day on uh, June the 2nd, and this is to strengthen the idea that Italian food is healthy, and I think uh, I'm trying to organize also a panel that maybe also have a, a link to this initiative at the consulate in the days before. So sport, Italian sport, means also a uh, healthy way of life that is uh, very much due to Italian food. So I wish you an excellent night, a fantastic panel. Uh, I hope you will eat well, drink well, and discuss well. Grazie, viva l'Italia, viva New York.
Thank you, Minister Genuardi. As you have seen, the minister and I have this sense of synthesis. We, we started late, but now we are ahead of schedule. And that leaves more time to the panelists that really have important things to say. And <coughs> without <coughs> further ado, after I have this sip of water. Thank you. It's now my great pleasure to introduce to you the founder and president of Gruppo Italiano that I'm sure many of you know already. And he's seated here in the front row, uh, Gianfranco Sorrentino, that many of you identify with Il Gatto Pardo, great restaurant uh, near the, Metropo the Modern Museum of Modern Art, and of several other enterprises, and next to him his lovely wife, Paola. But uh, Gianfranco, besides being a great restaurateur, um, he's somebody who really took to heart the issue of Italian food in a very important way. And the role that education of people of all ages to Italian food has in preserving these incredible resources, as the consul mentioned, uh, for Italy and not only for Italy. So uh, Gianfranco is the driving force behind this uh, new group. Um, he has already uh, shared many ideas with his uh, advisory board and with us. And I don't know how he finds all the energy to do the restaurants, many, and all these activities. But he's somebody who really believes in the power that eating well, eating according to certain principles can have. And please welcome Gianfranco Sorrentino. So. Thank you very much. I am uh, the famous uh, Gianfranco Sorrentino, <laughs> the president of uh, Gruppo Italiano. I want to thank the, our consul general. He has been always very supportive of Gruppo Italiano. I want to thank, of course, Direttore Albertini for his hospitality. And I want to thank, of course, uh, the, our sponsor, uh, being the USA, uh, tra, uh, Tradizione Import, Vias Import, and Aqua Smeraldina, and Il Mero Grano. But um, foremost, I want to thank you all of you uh, for coming uh, tonight and sharing with us the, the, the passion we have for Italian food. Uh, yesterday, I prepared a few notes and uh, something that I want to say. And unfortunately, uh, this morning I was uh, so excited that instead of taking the notes, I took my daughter's homework. <laughs> anyway, but uh, but I have a few few things anyway. So please bear with me. Uh, as we said, uh, food has been a very important part for us Italians, and is a part of our culture, of our history. Um, it's uh, so important that right now is also a very important part of our economy. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of our panelists uh, said that it is the oil of, of Italy. Uh, it is uh, so important that our authority uh, declared 2018 the year of the Italian food in the world. It is, uh, as I said, it's part of our culture, but I do believe that it's also part of American culture. If you think about New York without Italian restaurant, and can you imagine New York without pizza, without bolognese? Or can you imagine our breakfast without cappuccino and espresso? So, you know, it has been contagious, let's put it in this way. Um, now I want to take a few few minutes to explain you a little bit, to tell you a little bit what is uh, uh, Gruppo Italiano. Gruppo Italiano is a non-profit organization uh, that wants to promote the authentic Italian cuisine, uh, wants to promote Italian products, Italian producer, and uh, support the Italian restaurant all over the United States. How we do that? We do with the hard work of our restaurant, daily work of our restaurant, we do doing promotion, we doing uh, through education, and uh, uh, we do about the uh, with the philanthropy. Let me tell you, or better show you a few of the, the pictures that they can better explain what we're doing. Uh, for us, a promotion education is always parallel. Uh, the first picture is a olive oil tasting, where we teach to uh, our uh, trade members, uh, restaurateurs, but also the general public, people that love Italian food, how to recognize a good olive oil from a bad one. And we also, besides the tasting, we also show them how to blend the olive oil, so they can have a kind of olive oil that is according to their palate. 
Uh, here we can see some of the events that we do, a reunion that was our first year reunion. This is a kind of grappa tasting. So again, a promotion and education. The sommelier explained the grappa, where it was from, how it's made, the difference from the grappa from the north to the south. Then we taste about 10 different grappas. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how end up this event, because <laughs> you can imagine anyway. Uh, here we were promoting the uh, prosciutto di Modena, prosciutto di, uh, di Parma, and the uh, cheeses from the uh, some Italian cheeses. Again, without promoting this product for us was also teaching them about the quality of the, the, the product. Uh, this is, a, you can recognize, was an event that we did many years ago here at the Casa Zerilli Marimo. I still have all my hair over there. <laughs> uh, and we have uh, the founder of Gruppo Ristoratori Italiani, Tony May. Uh, the Gruppo Italiano is the natural uh, evolution of the Gruppo Ristoratori Italiani, an uh, organization created in 1979 to support the Italian restaurant. And of course, the problems of uh, that period were very different from the, let's say, the problem we have now. Uh, education, that's what really we care about. Um, we think that, uh, uh, that uh, teaching these young students, these young kids, what is uh, Italian food, authentic Italian food and uh, Italian products, you know, these kids are our future. These kids are the ones that they're going to cook in our restaurant. These kids are the ones that are going to run Italian restaurants. So it's better that we teach them not only to love Italian food, but also the respect about the product, how to use it. Um, and uh, we did uh, several classes. Here you can see Chef Vito teaching these uh, students how to make uh, the buckwheat cavatelli. Uh, we told them about the importance of the, uh, the, the nutritional fact about the ancient grain, wanting to use always great ingredients. Italian cuisine is a cuisine of ingredients, of products. Here, uh, at the, we did the classes at the ICC, the International Culinary Center. Again, the Professor Klein and uh, Chef Vito showing how to make the pastiera. Our um, chef, pastry chef uh, Pietro Macellaro is uh, showing how to make incredible dessert, Italian dessert with incredible products. Here my wife, uh, when I say philanthropy, we work with the St. Jude uh, Hospital with the Sloan Catering, Memorial Sloan Catering, we work with the, the uh, Central Park Conservancy. Here we did, uh, we sponsor an event at the St. Jude Os Hospital. Uh, we also do a trip uh, usually once a year where we bring uh, uh, our trade uh, members or journalists or people of Italy. Uh, we bring them to one of the region from Italy where we have a full immersion in the culture, in the food, in the wine. Here we were in Sicily, you can, uh, you can see that. We were in Noto where we tasted some chocolate with the peperoncino. Uh, here we are in Campania. This was last November where we brought uh, two journalists from the Observer and we had uh, the chance uh, to taste uh, the wines from the cart, uh, from the big barrel. And uh, always we have a good time. Of course, uh, drinking good wine, you have a good time. Uh, here we are in Tuscany and uh, here again we are, I think, in, uh, still in Campania. It was in November, so you can see where we were uh, looking how to make uh, the olive oil from the time they pick up uh, the olives and from the time that my grandmother made uh, the pasta and we use that olive oil. Um, so this is uh, what we do. Um, and we are very proud of that. But, uh, you know, we need, uh, mm, we need uh, your support. So on your way out, please pick up an um, and, uh, application and uh, join uh, the Gruppo Italiano. We need uh, your support, and we are here to welcome you in our uh, community. And now, before we talk about the, the topics that we want to talk tonight, I would like to, uh, to show you a little uh, video that was made by the uh, ITA, the Italian Trade Agency. Are we ready? Prego.
I'm starving now. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know why, every time I watch this movie, I'm starving. <laughs> anyway, um, before uh, uh, we call uh, our uh, moderator and panelists, uh, I want to think, uh, I want to say something. I think that in uh, this time of uh, globalization, of nouvelle cuisine, fusion, molecular cuisine, uh, time of a star chef, of food in as entertainment, I think that we should slow down a little bit, you know. Uh, we should step back and understand what is really important. Uh, very soon we're going to be 10 billion people on this planet. How are we going to feed them? And how are we going to feed them with delicious but healthy and safe food? Is the world going towards quality food or is going towards industrial mass production food? Um, is the biodiversity the challenge for food and restaurant for tomorrow? And, and Italy that has been always very innovative in this, how they are protecting these small farms and how we can make this incredible product come to our tables and why these products are so expensive. So these are one, some of the, the, the questions that we would like to have some information or answer. Uh, so I'm going to uh, introduce our curator Vincenzo Pascal and the Professor Dimitri and the Professor Sassoon. Prego. Hello. Uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, Gianfranco, thank you for introducing me. Thank you for Council General Francesco Genoa to be here. All of you attending, I know that some of you had to really uh, leave your job earlier to come here, making some sacrifice. Before starting a discussion, I really have won't spend a few seconds to remember uh, an amazing and loving person who I believe everybody of us know, knows as um, the founder, the founder and the financier of this terrific institution, Baroness Zirill, uh, Mariuccia Zirilli Marimo. Please, let's give a round of applause for this outstanding <laughs> philanthropist that really, um, her job is a legacy for many more of us who really come here, attend this event, participate, but above all for really nurturing the Italian, Italian American community and American community to give back and to really support philanthropy, philanthropy, culture, and everything uh, linked with Italy, which has a tradition of, uh, um, in this case, fantastic food, fantastic culture, and a worldwide exposure. Um, with, uh, with these two distinguished uh, panelists and colleagues, I will um, discuss about biodiversity. We met several times before. Why biodiversity? Biodiversity is now a, a center, at the center of a discussion uh, at the United Nations in every uh, Western country because really it's a theme, it's a basically um, something important to preserve the land and to really produce good food. We know that the year 2011, 2020, were de de uh, declared the decade, decade of uh, biodiversity in the United Nations. And, uh, professor, and the, as Gianfranco said, year 2018 will be the year of Italian food in the world. Um, which basically it's uh, one of the leading country in biodiversity and uh, uh, innovative farming. Professor Carolyn Dimitri, it's um, is a lady on my right here. Professor Lisa Sassoon is um, this uh, lady on my left. Um, they have both a terrific experience in the field. Professor Dimitri is an authority in biodiversity. She's an um, economist by education. Has a, written extensively on biodiversity, farming, and uh, innovative farming. I won't start with that. Uh, the first question is basically, biodiversity is a very broad concept. We know that it includes several topics, from water to land to even construction. But what is exactly biodiversity in terms of agriculture sector? Okay, well, in true professorial fashion, 
I'm going to give you a little long-winded and roundabout response to that question. Um, <clears throat> so biodiversity um, is a shorthand phrase that we use, and we are really um, talking about something called biological diversity. So I will give some simplistic answer to this question that was posed to me, but I would like to say at the same time, it's actually a very complicated topic in the sense that understanding the state of biodiversity globally is extremely difficult to do because it's hard to identify it, it's hard to see it, and it's hard to measure it. All things that I think are important to measure progress. Um, but generally speaking, when we think of biodiversity, we're considering um, the variety of plants, animals, and microorganisms on the planet. And within that, we look at the diversity within each species. So for example, we know that there are lots of plants and lots of vegetables. But more specifically, when we talk about tomatoes, there are 15,000 known varieties of tomatoes. So I think um, <clears throat> when you multiply that by every type of product, you <coughs> could see how it would be really hard to get a handle on crop diversity. Uh, where did you want me to go with this question again? I have a, a question ready for you. Okay. Tell us something, some positive trends in uh, biodiversity today and where basically this industry is going. Okay, so I, okay, in my mind, I don't usually think of biodiversity and industry together, but I will say um, there are a few important trends, uh, three of them. I'll just mention three of them. So one is the, the Convention on Biodiversity, which was signed in 1992, um, where 150 countries basically pledged that preserving biodiversity was really important for the food supply of the future and for and a whole bunch of other things, but we're talking about food today, so for the food supply. Um, two, I would say the seed vault, where we have this bank of seeds, is another really important step towards preserving biodiversity for the future. And three, in a more practical sense, I would say the growth of organic agriculture is really helpful in the sense that the lack of using synthetic pesticides and chemicals means that less biodiversity is killed on the farm when our food is grown, so that this is positive towards supporting biodiversity. So now industry, the food industry could use more organic food, and that would really help the planet. Yeah, indeed, indeed. <laughs> Your position <laughs> that, that consumers <laughs> should use, should buy organic food. Mm -hmm. Can you sp explain why, please? OK, well, first of all, you know, farmers are in business. So if you are not going to buy their product, they are not going to survive. So organic farmers preserve our farmland in a way that conventional farmers don't, just by the cropping practices they use and the types of products that they grow on their farm. And <clears throat> so I think from a social welfare perspective, supporting their existence is really important for the long-term health of our farmland. And so consumers should pay for this. It's important to us and it's important to our future generations. Well, one more question. You say that basically um, that urban farmers, not another topic, okay. choose basically to form not-for-profit organization. Why, when it's a business, basically? What? OK, but before I answer that, I want to say one more thing. Um, one, I think that our opening speaker, this very distinguished gentleman, talked about the need to feed many, many people in the future. And I think a lot of people point to that as a reason for why we should continue our current farming practices. And I would argue that using those practices in the long term will make it harder to feed all of these people. I, that was my last point on that. As far as urban farming, I think that the people that are involved in urban farming, um, it's Pretty, uh, pretty active sector in the United States and in Europe. It's kind, it's catching up, which is kind of opposite because usually, you know, Europe is ahead and then the U.S. jumps on the bandwagon. Um, I think that most of the people feel that there's something missing from the lives of humans, and that thing that's missing is our connection to our food by really truly understanding that food is the product of like human labor in soil, and that if we 
continue our lives of buying our food in supermarkets, we start thinking, you know, that food grows in boxes on trees, and it's really kind of a strange notion. So people who are working in urban farming, one, motion, one reason they have for doing this is to put it like right there in your face. You're walking from the subway and you're walking past this urban farm. There's a big one in New York, the Battery Urban Farm, right there in the financial sector. Um, you, you can all of a sudden start thinking more about your food. So for people who are doing a lot of the urban farming, they're trying to really raise people's awareness about the importance of food and the importance of agriculture. And so that is not a thing you can sell in the market though, right? So I think in that case, these businesses really have to work as nonprofits and they bring in donations to support the activities. So it's kind of a, like a very elaborate form of education, but it's not targeting a certain age, it targets a broad age of people. Thank you, Professor. Dimitri, I get back to you because you really opened the way to now involve Professor Sassoon, who basically is an, as a faculty at the Food Study Program at NYU, as a, one of the leading programs in the country, is a nutritionist, but also every year brings a, a bunch of students to a Food Study Program from NYU in Italy, where they explore several farms, northern, central, and southern Italy, and basically you open, uh, you bring these students, you try to educate them, changing their food habits. One of them is bringing them to the market, mm -hmm. uh, basically have a direct contact with the food, and you explain very well this uh, concept in your paper. Can you tell us first uh, the reaction, how they change basically the approach with the food when they go to the market, how they prepare, consume, sitting at the tables and, uh, you know. So so what I do is, it's a study abroad program, and although we're based, is this on? Although we're based in Florence, um, because Italian cuisine is regional, we try to travel to many different regions as much as possible in a few weeks, because it varies. That's the first surprise, because they think Italian food is meatballs and spaghetti and pizza and, you know, uh, baked ziti. And they're in for a big surprise when they learn that that is not just what Italian food is. It's, it's so different. So, um, and what we do is I use food as sort of a, a landscape or as a, as a way to understand the history, the culture, the identity, the economics, the health of Italy. And I think they, that the best way to really understand it is food because food is, is, a, is, is a way, a window of the world for, for, for to understand this. Um, so we visit many different th areas. We visit farms, artisanal producers. We um, go to wineries, olive oil. And I think the thing, the connection they get the f is the connection to people and the land and how food is identity. And that's something that many Americans don't, don't feel. Um, but food defines who you are as an Italian. If you're an Italian and you come from Tuscany, there are certain foods you eat that you don't eat if you go to Lazio. It's, it's something very unusual to an American to understand that who you are is what you eat in Italy. And what happens around that table is who you are. And that has been lost in the Italian, uh, in the American um, culture. Um, most of us aren't even eating at tables. And I don't think people would define their identity as based on food. <coughs> so we do go to, I don't even think I answered your question yet, so go ahead. No, you did, it. basically. <laughs> but no, what, one thing that I'm really impressed, basically, when you criticize, basically, the approach that American has, you include the food in education and human development. Basically, what does uh, what do the students they retain from this experience once once they come back to the United States? You did some research paper and you proved some some basically facts. I, I think that when we talk about food and diet, we never talk about culture and taste. And when there's nutrition policies or guidelines, we're always talking about people should eat certain nutrients, they should eat certain food groups, and what's left out is taste flavor, I, food identity, and that's never taught in schools. It's, it's never something that you serve when you, you're sick and go to the hospital. It's always broken down to nutrients. And 
this experience with students exposed them that food is so much more than just carbohydrates and calories <coughs> and low fat and saturated fat. And it is about flavor. It's about history. It's about the relationship you have with the land. Sort of piggybacking on what Carolyn just said is that you know where food comes from. You know how it's grown. Um, it, it's, it's, it's eaten because it has, brings back food memories. So when students went to Italy, it was really for, for them the first time they ever tasted the profile of so many foods, like of olive oil, because many of them had no idea. They thought that you just buy olive oil and, and buy those huge gallons and it's a pretty, you know, pretty canister and it sits on your windowsill for 10 months and it, you know, any of the health benefits are that great. But, Oh, I didn't turn on. I thought I was over already my time. <laughs> and so it was really the first time when they tasted all the different varieties of olive oil. They tasted all the different varieties of tomatoes. They thought there were two types of tomatoes. There's the, you know, the, the plum tomatoes and the cherry tomatoes. And they go to the open air market and they see like eight different varieties of tomato. Each one tastes different. Each one um, has a story. And all of a sudden, they, they developed a very different relationship with food. They, they, they ate cheeses. And the other thing that happened as a result of this program is Italy is known for the simplicity of the cuisine, especially in Toscana or certain regions where there's basically five or six ingredients. That's it. But what's unique is that you teach each ingredient in the dish. And that was something they never experienced. They didn't have to smother it with salt and all these spices. They were shocked to hear Italians don't use so much garlic. That was the biggest surprise. Um, because you taste the basil and you taste the olive oil as a condiment. Wine is a food. These were concepts they never had, that you sit down at a meal, and wine is not an alcoholic beverage that you get drunk. Wine is part of the meal. You grow up as a young kid, it's diluted, and slowly, slowly, you get the full glass. And you have this history, this relationship with food. So I think that food took on such a different meaning after exposing them to Italy and the relationship both Italians have and the taste and all these other the things we explored in the country. Thank you, Lisa. One more question for you, uh, okay. Karen. Um, we know that it's time of big data, so everybody's collecting data. Which, are, um, which is your position on these uh, demographic and consumer preferences, issues, trends, and changing, uh, changing appetites? In other words, how the taste of American public is changing according to this, uh, let's call, new wave or organic or biodiversity products? Is it really affect the mass consumers or is it still too soon? Well, I think that <clears throat> there was a time when it was a very small segment of consumers, but I think the millennial generation really is showing a change in the way people think about their food and how they want to spend their time. And this great desire for transparency in their food, understanding where it came from, how it was produced, uh, who the farmer was, what variety was grown. I think that this growing awareness, I, I don't say it's all the millennials, but the proportion is really rising. And I do see that this generation really may be the ones that are able to really push us into a, like a healthier, more tasty, but also planet and people friendly food system. Now, I will say that that opinion really is based upon a, my exposure to the NYU students who are very passionate about reforms in the food system and they are super interested in food culture. So it's possible that I'm a little bit, um, my view is a little skewed based upon the people that I see, but based even on the readings, um, millennials are more, uh, you, I mean, you get different results. One is they buy less groceries, but they buy more organic they buy more local food. So I, I do think that this is probably a moment where there could be this shift over. And I take that as a very positive sign. I agree, but I just would like to add one more thing, that it is a cost thing, because um, healthy food is very expensive in this country. And unfortunately, the food that's subsidized is the unhealthy, super ultra-processed food. And that is unfortunately what lots of people are 
buy because it's just what is available or what they could afford. And one striking difference between Italy and the States is that we have things like food deserts in the States, where that means people live in neighborhoods in the Bronx, in, the, in Brooklyn, where they don't have access to fresh food, where they have just bodegas, where it's all processed food. That really doesn't exist to, uh, to in Italy. I, I, don't, I would make that statement, that even people who don't have a lot of money have access to healthier food. They have access to go to the market when the fruit price of fruits and vegetables will go down. There's always a local market close to, to their home. So there are lots of differences, I think, in sort of this, the, the food landscape in Italy compared to the States. I have one more question. I believe my time is almost over. Uh, that for, take from your paper, the annual cost of obesity which now in the United States accounts for more than 99 billions in healthcare costs and lost productivity. Um, do you think there is a trend according to your experience with students that uh, biodiversity or organic can really reduce this uh, factor of obesity or there is a sort of awareness that the, it's important to eat healthy and basically uh, to fight this obesity, which is not only in the United States. You know, we spoke before that Chile took a very heavy uh, measure to reduce some products in the uh, national diet. Well, yes, I think that the more people are aware, the, if you eat a diet that is closer to nature, whole foods, I think the chances that you're going to eat unhealthy, the chances that you're going to gain a lot of weight are reduced. I think when people are eating ultra processed food that's been, that's, it's basically you just swallow, it's already been broken down. It lacks things and qualities that make us feel full like fruits and vegetables have fiber. Fiber adds to fullness. So when you eat whole foods, when you sit down and eat a meal, even sitting down and eating a meal, um, you tend to feel more satisfied. If you drink a lot of sweetened beverages, if you eat a lot of processed foods, foods that are coming out of boxes, and you're not eating whole foods, most of them are, don't have the qualities that make us feel satisfied. So we keep wanting to eat because we don't really feel satisfied from that food we ate. But when you sit down and you have a meal, a proper meal, and you eat whole foods, you feel more satisfied, you feel full because of the components of that meal. So I think more awareness of food, of the food system, or of organic foods, of biodiversity, definitely will make people think before they eat and hopefully rely more on um, food and not food products. Well. Thank you, Professor Dimitri. Thank you, Sir Sassoon. I have to give you the mic. Thank you, everybody. The mic. My, my friend and mentor regarding a restaurant, Andrea Fiano. Well, I simply won't be alone on stage, so please join me. <laughs> I don't have a solo program yet. So maybe I'll sit here. Yes. So good evening to Everybody again, this is sort of the second part. We're trying to make a passage from what we just heard and what we have just seen, including this persistent image on screen, and try to look at the, on one hand, the more practical aspects, aspects what is the passage or the passages needed uh, from, to bring this biodiversity, at least the Italian biodiversity, to the US and also a little bit on the global perspective. Uh, I have to say and I have to apologize that Ambas Ambassador um, Lambertini is not with us tonight in the sense that he had to cancel at the last minute. He is, after all, Deputy Ambassador of Italy at the UN. He is at the UN. Some important last minute meeting is more than understandable. He was going to present us with a little bit of the global perspective. 
connected to the UN goals on biodiversity. Uh, we'll pass on that. I think it might come back later on during the panel. And also in the Q&A, we hope to have time for Q&A. Um, before I actually pass the mic to Maurizio Forte, who is the Italian Trend Commissioner uh, in the US, I would like to, um, of all the different things that we heard in the first part, I would actually like to give you a, a very practical image. I think many of you, and I would add personally, unfortunately, are familiar with the mechanism of a big chain of coffee shops called Star something in the US. <laughs> and in this chain, when you enter, you're given a number of options that are quite unusual for an Italian. Uh, uh, you want given milk, you want soy milk, you want toll, which is really not toll, it's the smallest side, so on and so forth. Well, in Italy, and I think not just in Milan, there are pizzerias where they do the same with the tomatoes. And I went to this very distinguished place in Milan, and they asked me so many questions about which kind of tomatoes I wanted <laughs> on my pizza, which colors, which size, how to cut them, so that they told the person who took me there, it's a little bit of a cult-like uh, church, they say, where is this guy coming from? We don't have time for all this, uh, because I didn't know what to answer. Do I want yellow tomatoes? Do I want red tomatoes? Long, short, from that. So, Maurizio, you will tell us what the Italian government and the Italian Trade Commission is doing in practical terms to bring from the video we saw to the US this diversity. But you can also tell me right away if you think we will ever get the kind of pizzeria here, and will it work? Will, will people stand 10 minutes of question just on the tomatoes? I gave up on the rest. I say, you do. I actually did the, the worst possible thing, because I told them, you do whatever you want, which is like. <laughs> I had to ma mask my face for when I went for the second time, but you never tell them that. But, Seriously, is there a chance that we'll see that kind of a pizzeria here? I think so. I think so. New York loves these kind of things, and uh, and this is what uh, it makes this uh, this city so special. Uh, thank you very much to Gianfranco and uh, and Stefano for uh, organizing and hosting this uh, this event. Uh, Italian Trade Commission is the promotion agency of Italy. You have seen uh, the the video before that has been done together with the, uh, under the request of the Italian government to promote our food in the United States. Uh, when it comes to biodiversity, actually uh, the main uh, objective of Italian Trade Commission, and again the Italian government, uh, is uh, to protect it in the United States and throughout the world under the concept of authenticity. Uh, Italy has uh, uh, more than 800 uh, um, and, and 50 um, products with the geographical indication, GI, so it's not Gruppo Italiano, it's geographical indication, out of 3,300 of the European Union. So we have uh, one fourth of that. This is a huge biodiversity. I don't know how many different tomatoes we have, but for sure we have you. You have seen something like uh, 565 different wines with denomination of origin, then cheese, olive oil, and many other products. Some of this production, like Parmigiano Reggiano, Prosciutto di Parma, Pecorino Romano, San Daniele, are very, uh, I mean, is, is, are produced in a, in a big quantity and are exported all over the world, and uh, they are the majority of the products that can reach the US market. Other production is very small, local, made by small companies. Maybe they do not uh, are, uh, are strong enough and in the, enough quantity to reach the U.S. market, but of course it's still important that we keep them and uh, we can promote together with the territory, we can promote when you are as a tourist or as a, as a researcher, you go to Italy and you can enjoy this small production. So it is very important to uh, support and preserve the biodiversity. When it comes to the U.S. market, the key word is authenticity. Why? This is a problem. Uh, in the United States, not only, but in this market, uh, the phenomenon is, is so strong, is the strongest in the world that we have the Italian sounding products. That for us is an issue. Italian sounding means something that looks like Italian, looks like that, but it's not. So when 
you have traveled to Italy, you say they have discovered completely different cuisine, the completely different ingredients, completely different way of cooking. Uh, for one dollar of authentic Italian products, we have six dollars of Italian sounding. And uh, before launching the largest ever program to promote Italian food in the United States at the end of 2014, again uh, asked by our government, we have done an investigation in four key uh, states, New York, three state uh, area, Texas, Illinois, and California that account almost 50% of the consumption of Italian products. And we asked the consumer, do you know that there are some products that look Italian but are not? 50% say, no, I don't know. For me, all, everything that has an Italian flag, an Italian name, Italian style, non recipe, is Italian. Good. Other 50%, you know. Yes, we know that there are some products that are not Italian but look like. Are you buying these products? Yes, so we are buying, and why? Because it's easier to find. So with these two answers, we decided to launch this program where we invested almost 30 million US dollars. For the United States is nothing, but for Italian taxpayers is a lot of money, believe me. Um, in two main directions. One is a big advertising campaign with the, the claim, buy authentic Italian, get more. We, have, we had almost one billion impressions in these key four markets. And the key of this campaign is just inform the consumers that there is something that could be Italian, but is not. We are going to do the second campaign, that is the, the, uh, the second part of what we have already done. And this second campaign will be very much direct. Turn the package and check the label. Don't stop at the main label in front. Check it and check for made in Italy, product of Italy, imported from Italy. It doesn't mean that everything comes from Italy is gold. But at least if you are buying for something that is Italian and you are paying for something that is supposed to be Italian, be sure that this is true. The second thing is that we have finalized a number of agreements with the retailers in order to bring more Italian food on the shelves of American consumers and to introduce Italian new, uh, new vendors. This is the way we use to protect the authenticity and indirectly to protect the biodiversity that Italy can offer to the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I will pass now the word to Lorenzo Zurino, uh, who is a founder and CEO of the One Company, a marketing and branding specialist. Because part of the problem is what you just described, we can also not bring all the Americans to the US in, uh, as part of the NYU programs every summer, it would be nice. You will be very busy. And the question is how we bring this biodiversity here. Even if we find successfully the Italian sounding non-Italian products, there are problems with logistics, there are problems with costs, there are problems with transportation, availability, and, and so many other things. And can we get a little bit into that? and understand what are the main issues. Because sometimes very many good things, including some of what we saw in that uh, short video, are not really available or not easy to bring. And if, if they are brought here, the prices are astronomical. So please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say thanks to Gianfranco and to Vincenzo to give me the opportunity to be here and to discuss about this amazing things for me. I'm the fourth generation in the food distributor, so my family do this from 103 years. So we know very well how to, or, or we try to know very well how to sell the <coughs> Italian food, first of all here in the United States. And uh, yes, I agree with you. Our challenge, I think, is to, to make this biodiversity profitable for the United United States distributors and United States importers, and for sure for the retailers. And I agree with you that uh, one of the things that, we, that is very, very difficult is to have all this uh, food uh, authenticity, all this food uh, amazing product here and with consistency and here in the, in the, in the shelf of the, of the retailers in the restaurants, uh, which means it's two completely different business. Uh, the food service are the, uh, some kind of stuff and the uh, retail business are some other things, some other kind of food. And this kind of business is completely different. So if we would like to talk about 
the, the authenticity and uh, to this of the authenticity of this biodiversity, I think one of the things that we need to focus on is the, the price. So if you if you take a look of the shelf of this organic product that came from Italy or uh, this uh, biodiversity product that came from Italy are very expensive, super expensive. One of the things is the logistics are the logistic aspects that uh, the importers and the distributors uh, needs to to invest to to have this product here. For example, uh, if you t if we start to talk about business about this about the things, so first of all, it is one of the big difficult that we have is to talk if is to talk with the, the big distributors. For example, we have a lot of olive oil that came in the United States. And for sure, there is a lot of price of olive oil that we have in the United States. And uh, if we want to have one of the best olive oil, which means one of the particular flavor of olive oil that came from not Apulia, but for example, for Basilicata region, or from Sicily region, or from Lago di Garda, close to uh, Lago di Garda, uh, we, we, we cannot make volume and so if there's, if there's no volume, the big distributors doesn't invest them time to, to buy this product. Because you, we are talking about few pallets. And if we talk with the big distributors challenge, if we talk with the big distributors and importers, if we talk about pallet, they don't give us a chance to, to bring this product to the United States. So this is one of the aspects. And this is one of the problem that we have to have this kind of particular product here in the United States. So the volume and the second things will be the certification. For example, the artisan farmers that the professor said before uh, needs to invest to be just to be in the retail business here in some certification. One of that is the BRC and the FIS. So just to have this kind of certification that the farmer must to have to be in the retail business, just the little retail, you know, the Chico family markets here that we have in the tri-state. So we need to invest at least twenty, thirty thousand dollars just to have these two certification that must to have for be in the retail business. So it means that a little company that you know make probably two thousand, three thousand, five thousand bottle of oil he will never invest $30,000 of certification. So that's the second problem that, that we have. The third problem, I think, it will be the logistics. So if we start to do this kind of business, as with Gianfranco said a lot of time, we cannot have containers that come. We need to have the groupage. That we have a few importers here. I know uh, Gennaro. And so he knows how is the, the groupage. So it's a mixed container with a lot of pallet of different companies. So normally, the cost of a container from Italy to United States, let's say from a port of Italy to United States port, New York, it will cost around $3,000, right? So if we mix a con of one item, so one company that make one invoice that from Italy came in United States. If we start to do ropage, so 20 companies that doesn't have the power to sell a container. So mix a container, one pallet of oil, one pallet of particular tomatoes, and another pallet of particular bread, whatever. So each pallet, it will pay at the custom broker something like $100, $150 per pallet. Because it will cost, for each invoice, you have to pay the, the US government a taxation about that invoice. So. The cost of the containers that normally will cost about $3,000, $3, it will arrive till the $5,000, $6,000. And that's why that product will cost more. Because after that, you have to make the markup of the importers and the markup of the retailer. So that product that in Italy costs around <laughs> 1 euros arrive in the shelf of a supermarket in the United States close to $6. And that's why the problem that we have to solve this kind of problem. It's just to give a few examples. I don't want to be the black shape, but this is the, the reality. Well, we, we're trying to be in the business of solutions, not just. Oh, uh, yeah. But uh, 
I think this is important because it gives, brings some reality to the oh, yeah. issue. Uh, and, and I think we have to also look at, we, we look at the wholesaler, the distribution, the, but there is also an issue with retailers. What do the retailers do? And also not, because we're not talking just about Italian retailers. For the most, we talk about American retailers and, and big chains. Uh, Stefano Cordova, who is the CEO of a company who has his own name, uh, the uh, Cordova Food Design, is lucky enough to be innovation chef right now, currently, at Bindi North America. It's interesting because I was, I kept reading innovation chief, chief innovation. No, you're an innovation chef. But you have a long experience in retail with big American retailers that you advise. What is their reaction when the, I mean, because the, uh, let's not forget one thing, just to be honest. I remember a few years ago, somebody else might remember in the audience, uh, during the fancy food show, there was a big event from Puglia, from the Puglia region. It was done at the uh, Bryant Park restaurant. It was a fantastic event, and now we have all these images. Uh, and they say, one second, everybody, there probably were 150 people sitting down. We want to thank every, somebody for what uh, you had tonight, the food you had tonight. And they presented a very old lady dressed in black, and they explained that in the morning she left, uh, she left her farm, she didn't take any luggage, all she had was the food that she served that night. Now, I imagine that's not exactly what we want and we promote. We cannot start the business of bringing <laughs> old ladies with all the respect, and I, I, I do have it. So how we make it in a serious way, it's particularly new, in light new, of your experience. It's a new concept, yeah. the, the old lady. Oh, uh, um, well, I think I have some solution that the Italy has been working for the last 10 years. In other words, you know, logistics is becoming the most expensive thing in the food business for everybody, anywhere. Uh, the food is not expensive to grow, but to move around becomes more expensive anything else, because you transport water in most of the case, so there is a value. Uh, the other thing is the biodiversity in Italy is so hypersensitive to the chefs, so the chefs have the, they say, uh, great respect for the agriculture, right? They know that they don't do anything. We just take great products and we try not to, you know, mess up with that. Uh, <clears throat> so what happened in the last 10 years is, is how do we, uh, as a chef and also as a, as a, as a chain uh, um, designers, can we preserve this by this biodiversity for the 10 billion people for the next 20 years? Italy has, has grown right now around 500 laboratory of cuisine <coughs> in Italy that are close right to the farms, to the small farms. And, and you can go and, and all the recipes that goes from fresh, washed, ready to be served, or, or to be uh, to be stood down, or all the way to a very advanced technology. Some of these plates over here, they look like you work in an Intel, uh, uh, making uh, manufacturing. So they, you are the innovation chief. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I know we work very close about with the retort technology, high pressure. We talk about uh, uh, new azote packaging and so forth. But the food comes directly from the farm, a small farm. That the person who's making tarts and they pick up the Trentino apples with a small farm, the following day you have a beautiful tart to go to Milano or go to Rome. They made it for the, for the, for the you know, serve that way. Um, why? Why are we doing that? Because we don't want to be a slave of the high commercial production. Because of that, what it does, it, uh, it is not sure. If you go all over Europe, and unfortunately we haven't had success of uh, bringing the food in this country, there is a high level, I would call it, modern processing of the food and preserving the food. Because this is, this is required, no preservatives are required, non additional, everything has to be fresh, everything has to be uh, produced within the 24 hours, you know, <coughs> and served. Where in Europe, you can go to the best supermarket, Picard in Paris, or you go to, you know, in London, or you go to Madrid, and you find this food. Right, uh, but over here, pre-packaged food is something that you can't talk about it because people are used to, to full of sugar, full of salt, and so forth. So that's that's one of the solutions that, that we're talking about. Now you can go in the last 15 years. You see the evolution of the uh, you know bar in Italy. You went from uh, a gelato place, cornet in the morning, and there was no food around. 
Now you go to this uh, uh, bar in Italy, they will sell you risotto for lunch and so forth. This, this food is made two days ago, delivered, they, would, they, they thermalize and they serve it. That's, that's the culture that is creating and is very different uh, from, from anybody else. You know, in addition to that, what happens is the farmer is selling directly to the chef or to the bar by passing through. It's in the, there is not, and, and may, may, may ruin your business at some point because, but it's the only way we can grow and preserve a certain things. But now, you know, it becomes more and more expensive about rent, building kitchen. That eliminates some of the, the, the economics where, you know, a city like New York or a city like Rome or Milan or whatever it is, you cannot afford to do that way. So, and this, the, this food is designed by some of the top chefs. You go to, uh, uh, in France, uh, or, you know, you have Alain Ducasse, he's making his food. Uh, you have Joël Robuchon, we work together you know, in a couple of projects in, uh, in uh, uh, Fleury Merci, one of the factory. And then <coughs> myself, a couple of the chefs in Italy, we work on this, on, on this concept. The food is it's authentic, it's fresh, and, 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 it's, uh, and it's amazing. And that's the future of the culinary and preserving the water, the herd, and like you said, how do we support the small farmer? They'll disappear. You know, or how, how do you move this food around and they keep preserving the special tomato, the special apple, the special orange, and so forth, that you won't be able to do it. It can be in a marmalade, or it can be fresh, or it can make into a gelato, and so forth. Does that answer a little bit of your question? Give a little hope. It, it worries little me, hope. because I hope you're not telling us that we will never get them here. No. Sorry, but I have to ask but you. But I tell you one thing. I tell you one thing. It's coming. And they're coming very, very fast. Because the pros are incredible. And there is a, and there is a, a very good organic chain that's starting to design the, uh, the kitchen accordingly to, you know, to these uh, uh, products. Because, they, because Italy, in particular nowadays, uh, or people that they are visiting this place, they started to realize this food is incredible. They can even make it in their own restaurant. You take a, there is a chain in France, 400 trattoria restaurants, okay? They have only one cook. The food comes every day from Italy for this restaurant in, into distribution, and it's not frozen. It's oh, I'm pleased you give us examples of France and other countries. We, we want to know what's happening here. We want to know if there's... What I'm saying, no, the no, same company that opened up plays here, and there's a lot of, it, there's a lot of uh, company that we work together with them just to, to design and to have incredible food. Uh, and, but also, it's easy to change the menu. Look how much money you spend in R&D. You know, it has to go from the marketing and do, you know, I'm talking about a large company. You know, marketing research costs money. Egos against each other, because the CEO may like something or somebody else is doing something. Then it's, it's gonna transfer all the way to the supply chain and so forth. That's in a large company, because millions and millions of dollars, and a lot of job lost for everything else, where you can just have a multitude, 600, 700 different pick authentic, great Italian food, and you can just taste it and make a decision accordingly what your customer likes. But also you can educate people on certain ingredients that they, in general, wouldn't be able to uh, afford to bring here. Thank you. Uh, it's good that we, I think we have a lot, uh, plenty of material for questions, but I would go, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking about the fate of Italian grapes, which are fantastic. They barely make it to the US. They've been killed by some kind of radiation when right. they're brought here. Right. And other grapes from other countries, particularly from Latin America, are making it. I don't know why the Italians are not. I think politics has to do with it, not biodiversity. We barely get to see these grapes. And when they get here, they have a cost that is th two, three times, four times right. the cost of grapes from Chile or whatever. Which actually brings me to Mr. Sorrentino, because we talk about distribution and importing and transportation and logistics. We talk about the retail. Now, all this biodiversity gets to the restaurant. What is there to do? I know you are very often bringing an example that has to do with the fish that here is always misspelled because they call it Branzini, even if it's a single one. <laughs> they, they, they haven't learned that you can say Branzino, but it's like Panini. Uh, <laughs> but uh, tell us about it, because I think the question is posed. I mean, Branzino. Branzino is available from a farm in I don't yeah. know where, or you can get the real thing. What does the restaurant do? And probably what different restaurants do about it? I think the, the main problem is uh, to, let's say, educate our uh, customer 
that uh, the good food costs money. So when you were talking about the Branzino, well, there is the Branzino from, let's say, um, almost a perfect ecosystem from Orbetello and cost $12 a pound. And you can get a Branzino from uh, a farm raised Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe, and it cost $3.99 a pound. So you can see the discrepancies, so you can understand. One branzino is uh, full of hormones, full of antibiotics, so you're eating what you're spending. Anyway, my, uh, my father used to say, tanto spendi, tanto appendi. So I don't know how to translate it, anyway. So my, but not now, but before my problem was to, to, to educate our customer that is very important to understand what we eat, what we put inside our body. So beside the delicious has to be healthy, has to be safe. Um, we have to make them understand that unfortunately good food costs money. And uh, lately, I have to say that the, the, the people is spending more, uh, pay more attention to these things. You know, uh, I want to do another example. We were talking a few few days ago. He remind me. I had a customer that uh, is in the fashion industry. Went to the leopard desert East, I ate a dish, and then he called me, and sent me an email saying this dish is so expensive, twenty-eight dollar, and you know uh, I paid that dish sixteen dollar to another restaurant. So I was thinking, thinking, and then I sent another email and said, you know, it's about time that we start to understand that we have to spend more money for stuff that we put inside our body and the less money for stuff we put on our body <laughs> and uh, she she was very understanding you know and she asked me to write the the the, the, the where the, my my products they come from and i thought probably this is a way to educate the people you know the, the to trace where the the the, the 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 product are coming from probably we should have a kind of uh, software that can trace all the products um, I guess that's my answer anyway. Well, thank you. I think the, before we open to the public, I think it's important for the four panelists to I kind of is, uh, ask each one of you a question related to your own business. But I think it's time to open it up. We brought up a lot of different points about biodiversity. We look at that on a global scale, but we also look more specific about Italy. Any specific suggestions for, for what is, I think, the theme of tonight, how to make the biodiversity more available here, more known here, and, and basically affordable too for everybody? Because yes, if, I know that there are importers that will bring absolutely anything from Italy here, but I don't think that is the solution. It's very nice, of course, but this is not the solution. So I would open for a few minutes of remark, if you, any of you has, to summarize. We don't have to follow a specific order, but what we have been discussing so far. Just because I like to be the black shape, so I will follow the, uh, my opinion is that, uh, first of all, we cannot give illusion to old Italian farmers and old Italian producers. I think that we need to, to learn we need to explain them that there's product that could be here and products that couldn't. And first of all, because if we are talking about the space that there's between United States and Italy, and we just want to give you few time, there's 21 days of uh, fright between the part of Naples, for example, Naples and the part of New York. So 21 days that a product needs to be in a containers and uh, needs to be safe and needs to be fresh. So just to give you an example, there's a lot of product that could not be 21 days in a containers. Let's talk about the fresh things, mozzarella di bufala. There's a lot of mozzarella di bufala here. There's a lot of fresh mozzarella di bufala and there's a lot of frozen mozzarella di bufala. And which is the difference? The price. And how is too different that price? Because if you want to have the mozzarella di bufala here fresh, 
the mozzarella needs to fly. And so you have to invest something close, five, six euros each kilo, each kilo, just to make them fly, each kilo. So if you come in Italy, you buy the buffalo mozzarella for eight, nine euros, no more. Here, you will buy the buffalo mozzarella for $25, just because that buffalo fly. So I think that we need to be very straight with the, the producer. And just to explain them that if the winery, if the producer make 1,000 bottles of amazing wine, but just 1,000 bottles, it cannot be exported here in the United States. It's an illusion. Because how he can make, if a pallet of wine is 700 bottles? How? There's no way. It is impossible. And there's no business. And it's not profitable for him. And it's not profitable for, for the importers and the distributors, and the distributors in the United States. So yes, the biodiversity, and I want to give you an answer at your question. The biodiversity, for sure, is an opportunity. But must to be studied from the Italian producer and must to be studied from the American distributors. So it's an opportunity, but not for, all, but not for everything. There's a few products that I think needs to be Italian product in the way of it and in the way of business. And there's some other product that for sure we need to make them taste. One of the point is the education. So there's an example that I, I, I used to do anytime someone called to uh, call me to explain how is my business. So I have one of my best men at my wedding that is one of the largest distributors in the United States. So Andy said, Lorenzo, I love the Italian food. His company runs about $500 million per year, so it's a good company. And 20% of his business is with Italian products. So he said, Lorenzo, believe me, I love the Italian food. And if I can, I would like to buy more Italian stuff, more Italian products. But I have a big problem here. So, no, and uh, he explained me the example about chicken parmigiana. So I don't want to eat chicken parmigiana. I know that the parmigiana is made with the eggplant and not with the chicken. But I have to buy a chicken. And you know why? Because the United States asked me the chicken parmigiana. So one of the points that we need to focus on is to educate them that the parmigiana is made with eggplant and it's not made with chicken. So this is one of the points that I think my, my thing is in my opinion is that we need to educate them that there's a big difference between the real parmigiana and the chicken parmigiana. Uh, yeah, I want to say something not as a trade commissioner, but as a, as a consumer, as a, a normal person, because trade commissioners are not very normal. Um, I think one, I, I, I do agree, and we have discussed many times with uh, Gianfranco, about the fact that high quality products grown in the proper way, organic, uh, respecting the environment, are more expensive than the, the mass product done in the conventional way. <coughs> but I think that the most expensive things are the bad habits. So since it's the right time, let's try to cook together. Five ingredients, good quality, or even organic, so you're gonna have good organic pasta, good tomato sauce, parmigiano reggiano, not parmesan. Parmesan doesn't exist. Parmesan is the English word for a cheese that doesn't exist. We only know parmigiano reggiano, or grana padano, or pecorino romano. A tablespoon of olive oil and a leaf of basil. So it's two dollars per person, 20 minutes preparing, 400 calories, 40 minutes to digest. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that you have to cook. You have to stay home with your family, your friends, your partner. You have to buy the, the proper food uh, in a supermarket, not just uh, have the uh, takeaway or uh, food delivery or whatever. And that's the way that even great, of course, you will not eat every day the same stuff. But with a very small budget, with few minutes, you're going to have a great meal made with the best food. But habits and the, 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 
the, the way of living make a big difference. So we cannot preserve the biodiversity, we cannot have great way of eating if you don't change the habits. Like, I mean, for the environment, you have to separate the paper from the plastic from the organic, you have to switch on the light if you are not in a room, you have to close the tap if you are using, you know, using the water, you don't have to keep your engine on if you are not uh, using the car. So this is a small thing that can change the environment can change our life. So again, as a consumer, I come back to what Gianfranca said, maybe slow down a little bit. Because this is the only way we can feed how many billion of people we will be in a decent way using decent products. I'm just, I'm just gonna add something from my, from my point of view, just because it's... Uh, 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 I'm I, I, not killing your business of the ready meal. So no, 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 no. No, 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 no. It's not. It's not the ready meal uh, in, no, in right. self. Uh, it's not the ready meal in self. It's just about how do we uh, preserve some of the, the the greatest ingredients and so forth. But we know one one of the main elements of the Italian cuisine uh, is the respect, obviously, for the products, the knowledge of the products, but it's also the hospitality, uh, which is going to be very, very important. The hospitality, which is very, very important, as we move forward, and we redesign the way we eat the way we design, we, 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 uh, we serve our food and so forth, that we don't lose the respect for the people that, that we work for, the people that we serve, the people that we invite home and so forth. Why? Because the element uh, that will unite each generation uh, as we move forward, as we transport the food in a different way, maybe we'll have a Tesla satellite where the food moves in, in 25 seconds, doesn't cost, that doesn't cost us anything. Uh, we never lose the touch, the food, like you said, you know, the urban uh, people can see how the food is grown. We never lose uh, the sense of the hospitality and the great work the, the agribusiness does for us. I mean, we, we can get up in the morning and buy anything we want, but somebody's doing that work. Uh, we can never lose uh, the ability to recognize the people that go in the middle of winter and go get the best fish for us. Uh, and we pay for it. And we have to, um, most important, we have to protect these people. And that's what I was saying about building this laboratory. It's more about protecting the small farmer, the mold grower, and, and the small fishermen that can survive and stay for us. Why do we do this? Because we love good food. And we don't want to lose those guys. If you look, if you look when, you, when, when the slow food organization came out, it didn't come out to preserve anything. It was for our own enjoyment. Let's prefer the, the, the great food because we can enjoy it for the rest of our life and for our kids and so forth. So that's, that was the reason about this laboratory. It's not because we want to be overly technical, it's because these are the people that make the food for us and protects our culture because they cultivate it. The chef doesn't cultivate it. The restaurant is not but a place where we protect our culture, but these guys preserve the culture. Well, uh, I want to finish saying what I started to say at the beginning. Uh, we are what we eat. Uh, the World the Health World Organization declared Italy the healthiest country on this planet. And there is a reason. So I, I want to finish it saying the same thing. Good food costs money, but we are what we eat. We have to understand we have to spend more money for the food and probably save on the um, clothes, on the car, on the house. And that uh, has to be the future because of spending more money, we motivate the people doing they, their job. I mean, I mean and I, I'm gonna finish. An architect and, and <coughs> a great professional who grows a great food shouldn't be making uh, less money than an architect or a painter or, 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 and so forth. These people feed us. I'm, I'm a chef, so I respect these guys. Well, uh, there is biodiversity, there's also diversity on this panel. <laughs> we brought up a lot of things, uh, and we, I think it's time to open to questions, but not just to the panelists here, but the professors from NYU and Vincenzo Pascale. So any question, this is the time. I hope you have them. And uh, since so many issues were brought up, obviously we can't find solutions tonight, but please.
please go ahead okay thank you so much for the very interesting um conversation and look forward for the second and third chapters as a language and culture educator of italian and, and a, an italian mother who cooks all the time so i s certainly yes, can relate to the amount of time that we need to spend on cooking and certainly i see the points in terms of cost, uh, you know, um, Italian food is healthy because certainly there is a lot of uh, um, manufacturers, a lot of work, etc. But it's one observation, but actually I would like to understand, do you think that uh, the most challenging aspect is actually to make people understand that um, eating um, healthy starts before, so you know, looking for the right ingredients during, because you will never see an Italian, an average Italian uh, tasting his food in front of the TV, because for us is an art and needs to be respected. Uh, so it's the relationship that we have with food, you know, for, for us food is sacro. So for us, we, I always teach my students, we do not disrespect the food, even if it's a simple piece of bread with a little bit of oil. So would you say that on top of you know, cost, or logistic, or transport, etc., the most challenging aspect of making people understand how valuable is Italian food is understanding the whole experience with food that we have. You know, and, and again, our relationship with food. You know, certainly we are what we eat, but there is a relationship that we have with food. So for us, it's not simply survival, but it's an entire you know, a representation of an entire history, identity, etc. It's a long, it's a long observation, but I think I made the point. Thank you. The question is again, how would you, how would you? How would you, on top of explaining, you know, why it's healthy, and you have done an incredible job in explaining us to us and explain the cost? How would you, on top of that, add that eating healthy is also a matter of, again, educated people is food is more than survival? Okay. We want maybe we we get a few questions and we. Yeah, I do a lot of, um, of my food shopping at Trader Joe's, and they do sell organic pasta uh, from Italy. I noticed that on a lot of the uh, olive oil bottles, the, 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 it, there's an inscription, packed in Italy. Is that regulated by the Italian government? Can you talk about that, that phenomenon, where that comes from into Italy, and how it's... Process. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. yes. Thank you. I think there was a third question and then we... Hold on, for, wait a second for the mic. A friend of mine who's been visiting the States because her daughter moved here is from Torre del Greco and she was shocked at the flavor and the quality of the Italian olive oil and other products here. And I tried to explain to her the same way the gentleman explained that it's too expensive. If you're a small manufacturer, you don't have enough volume to bring it here. How do you find the products that are good that maybe are from small manufacturers or small companies here if they can't afford to advertise, even if they get here? OK, the three questions. The packed in Italy phenomena, yeah. and the, the small producers that cannot advertise, and the role of education and the concept of feeding oneself, not just for the sake of feeding, but as part of a culture. I can answer the third one. Okay, so I think Ma I think Maurizio will start with the packed in Italy. Um, in the olive oil industry, it's absolutely normal to use the concept of blend. Before you saw in the presentation of GI, uh, Gianfranco has uh, organized one of these tasting and blend section in uh, his restaurant. Uh, this is absolutely normal. There is nothing illegal. It's not a fraud. It's not, a, uh, uh, how to say, it's misleading for the consumer. Why? Because if you buy uh, a specific brand of olive oil with a specific uh, taste, one is called uh, 
Leggero, another one is called Strong, another one is called Fruttato. You want basically the same taste and the same uh, features throughout the different years. To obtain this result, they have to blend different olive oils. If they mention clearly that this is a blend and uh, on the back of the label usually you have olive oil uh, from different places and countries and you have the list of countries and usually the list uh, is uh, uh, the, the first country is the highest, the higher percentage in the olive oil and now it's going decreasing. So this is absolutely legal, there is no defraud and uh, it doesn't mean that there is something is made in Italy, all the ingredients are Italian. Imagine coffee. Not a single bean of coffee is made in Italy. Imagine chocolate. Not a single uh, bean of uh, cocoa is made in Italy. Nevertheless, uh, uh, coffee and chocolate are very important products of Italy. See, the same is for olive oil. Can be a blend. Can be a, if what is important is first, if they say is extra virgin olive oil, must be extra virgin olive oil. Otherwise, it's a fraud. The second thing, if it's a blend, they must declare that it's a blend. Then, if as a consumer, you want a different kind of olive oil, you want a pure Italian olive oil, you have some labels that say 100% pure Italian olive oil, or even more, you have the PDO, um, protected denomination of origin, with the blue and, uh, and uh, yellow uh, trademark from European Union. That means that if this olive oil is uh, as a geographical indication, must be done in a specific area using only the olives of this area must be, um, I don't know how to say, um, um, produced, pressed in that area and bottled in that area. So it's consumer's choice. What is important is that the label is fair, is clear. Then as a consumer you can decide also because the blend usually costs $8, Pure Italiano is $12, PDO $18. So it's your choice. What is important is that the label is, is saying the truth. So it's not a fruit, and there is nothing strange that in the olive oil there is this blend that is made everywhere. It's made by American producers, made by Spanish producers, made by Greece, it's made by everybody. The other two questions? Jean-Franc, you wanted to answer the... Yes, the third, uh, the third question the lady said where to find those products, small producers, come to Gattopardo for dinner, you find everything. <laughs> well, let me say something, let me say something because he's the black sheep anyway, because it's, it's uh, not true. It's uh, true that costs more, but you can find uh, the product here, absolutely, you can find uh, the best of the best from Italy. Uh, cost more, no doubt about that. So, uh, I could say that I grew up in a warehouse in the middle of tomatoes, flowers, and uh, olive oil, and pasta. So uh, there's a things that my father used to say when I was a, a, kind, uh, a child that said, Lorenzo, listen, if uh, the olive oil costs less than car oil, so don't buy that olive oil. <laughs> So, because for sure it's something unbelievable. So if I have to suggest something to the lady that asked us uh, how the, the flavor is different, so my suggestion is if you find an olive oil that costs less than a car oil, don't buy. Because 100%... <laughs> yeah, the car oil is <laughs> something on the education. I want to touch base with you, just maybe uh, I can answer your question. Um, when you go in the Culinary Institute, are you trained? Most likely, 90%, you never use the recipes except for, for desserts. But the most important thing is how to know the ingredients and how to cook the ingredients based on the season of the ingredients. The same tomatoes, if you pick it up in July or you pick it up in August, I'll tell you the, the tomatoes, how should be used. If it's for salad, if it's for sauce, if it's for packing. And I think that's, that... Uh, um, that kind of tradition sometimes is, except for the professional, you learn from your grandmother, your mother, and, and the guy who grows the food, and be able to pass along uh, to the next generation. You know, I, I remember my, my mother or even my grandmothers, I think they're the best doctor in the world. 
You know, if I said to you, oh, you gotta eat this because it's good for your diabetes. You gotta eat the lentils because it's got a lot of iron. You know, then, then 40 years later, you go to university and, and, then you, and then you learn the same thing. How do they know? They never went to school, right? You know, in the winter time, they always give you the green vegetables and so forth during the spring. Oh, because you gotta cut all the fat that you eat during the winter time. So it purify your blood. So that's, that's the kind of thing that we pass along from generation to Thank generation. Thank you. Vincenzo, you want to say something? Is that question? Surely, it's a question addressed to a large and who feels to answer. Coming here, I stopped in Barcelona and Nobles on Union Square. There's a huge section of books about cooking, culinary. It's a huge sec of book about how not to die. Everything you have to eat, not to die. So basically, <laughs> the message is there uh, to cure every kind of disease. There is a recipe. Of course, the, the, this book will be a bestseller. And however, I have an, something uh, probably uh, addressed to Andrea. The history of uh, food education in this country is really, for what I know, signed by media. Julia Child really on TV uh, somehow opened uh, the American public to the French cuisine. Then we had a huge wave of chefs, I mentioned some, Emeril, Mario and so on and so on. So they really changed the way the American approached the food and um, and uh, uh, relayed the food, had the nutritional experience. Italy was missing in this way. Never, for what I know, had a chef having a, a, a TV program on Food Network until last week, when you know, probably Chef Bottura went there. It was a blast. It was amazing. Uh, uh, media audience, amazing success. The question is, is really this uh, way, this, um, uh, the media, the food TV network, the newspapers, uh, even the, well, I knowledge, New York Times food section, is really the wave to promote this Italian biodiversity and this new wave of Italian um, food industry? Probably Maurizio Forte may uh, have some clue. This is a kind of it's a strategy, which is a strategy really to open the large American public to this uh, uh, Italian uh, um, food di biodiversity. Before, bef uh, yes, but actually, before Maurizio answers, I would like to say, uh, first of all, among the this um, food stars, whatever you want to call them there are also Italian sounding ones. Yes. So we have the equivalent of Parmesan on TV, of people that <laughs> pretend to show how to cook Italian and they probably never went uh, further than Austin, Texas. And, and that has done some damage too. But on the other hand, we had, we certainly had quite a few uh, starting, I mean, I'm thinking of Lydia, but I can think of many others who are showing on TV how to prepare Italian food. They're promoting certain ingredients, and they have certainly had a lot of responsibility. I mean, when you talk to Americans, they often quote the book they have, the recipe they read. I don't know of anybody who, thank God, has written a book about how not to die, how to eat Italian and not die. I mean, there, there are plenty of books. I don't think the problem is books. Uh, the problem is how this, how this is, how, how much is read, how many copies this book sell. But they, TV has been incredible, an incredible uh, agent in promoting food. But of course, half of the recipes have enough butter to make you die the same night. So <laughs> it's not that TV in itself is healthy. Uh, many of this stuff is completely unhealthy. So before anything, and uh, b before giving you the word, uh, Maurizio, I, I think when in your answer about olive oil, which of course uh, you don't need me to tell you was correct, let's also not forget the, that the rules, the regulations are very different b here and in Europe as to what is olive oil, what is extra virgin olive oil. So what is sold here sometime for virgin olive oil or extra virgin olive oil would not be considered such in Europe. So often, correct me if I'm wrong, an Italian label extra virgin olive oil is a guarantee even above and beyond what the regulation in the US does because here is some, some of these products that not really, would not pass the test in Italy. Um, 
we had many, many TV programs, many articles on newspapers about some uh, uh, food frauds in Italy, especially for, for olive oil. Well, uh, that's true. We have found something, but we have found it because uh, only the Ministry of Agriculture last year has done more than 60,000 uh, controls and check on, uh, on uh, agri-food products. And together with the other ministries and the other organization, we have almost a half million controls in Italy on food every year. So if you go on the 12th street outside and you start stopping all the cars on the street, I'm sure that in one day you find 10 cars that have something wrong. Somebody hasn't paid uh, the insurance, somebody else uh, has drink a little bit too much, somebody else has something else, has the driving license that is expired. So if in Italy we found a lot of, if we have some scandals and some issues, it's because we control a lot. And on average, our controls, not only in Italy, but in European Union, but in Italy specifically, are among the highest and, and the toughest in the world. So if we are the healthiest people in the world, it's because we cook, we eat good food, and we good uh, healthy and uh, safe food. Because if you have great olive oil, but then it's not safe, it's also adulterated, it's not good. About the Vincenzo's uh, question, I'm quite optimistic about the attitude of the new generation, millennials. Uh, everybody's talking on millennials. We should have some panelists as millennials instead of talking always as, uh, about millennials. Nobody's a millennial here, sorry. Uh, it's, it's quite obvious. Mm, the, it's late millennials, very late millennials. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just because I'm jealous. That's that's the point. Um, because they have a different approach. Uh, the approach is uh, because of, of course, the social media, the different circulation of information, spending more traveling, and uh, in buying good food, and uh, in sharing good food with friends in the nice restaurants. I realized that not only in uh, in uh, United States, but even in Italy, because I mean the problem of eating properly, of cooking, selecting the right ingredients. We have even in the young generation in Italy, especially some years ago. But now, young teenagers and millennials. We used to call teenagers once upon a time. Now they are millennials. They are really uh, paying different attention. We must be ready to to offer the right educations in the right way, in the right moment, so not maybe the formal school, but something available on, uh, on a social media or an application. And on the other side, we do not have to, le to let them down. So the industry, the restaurants, the uh, institutions must be very honest, very transparent. That's why I say it's consumer choice, but the labels must be clear, and people has to get the use to, le to read the labels. So I'm quite optimistic because I, I see it, especially in developed countries. Of course, countries that are very poor, they have other issues, just to feed every day and survive. But in developed countries, I think we are going in, in the right directions, also in terms of respect for food. Because the first big offense we can do to food is to waste it. This is the biggest. So let's start home, don't do this. Even a slice of bread. The day after can become something else still good, still healthy. So this is a very, very important. And I'm quite optimistic, new generations are paying more attention and investing more money in this. Um, I don't know what about the millennials in your restaurant. Well, uh, I'm still in your job, so. Not, not, <laughs> certainly not being a millennial, but coming from a generation that kisses the bread any bread that is thrown away, and of course being asked all the time, what is this thing that you do? What are you kissing the bread? What is this all about? I think uh, time has come to, obviously come to a conclusion, the evening cannot go on forever. Needless to say, hopefully, we, we leave you with more questions than you had when you came in, and more room for questions to all the panelists and the distinguished speakers from NYU. Uh, and also, this is the first of a series of events, and as a matter of fact, the closing will be Gianfranco Sorrentino telling us what are the upcoming events of this year so that there will be more chances. It was obviously impossible to answer all, answer all the questions tonight. So 
Thank you very much. Gianfranco. Well, thank you very much to all of us. Uh, regarding the next uh, Italian Table Talks, uh, please uh, stay tuned and uh, check on our web uh, www.ilgruppo-italiano.com. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, we can go upstairs and enjoy with some Italian others and wine. <laughs>